Good evening. Felt a dreadful urge today to go down to BC Place, the stadium, and get myself a souvenir, memorabilia, of Expo 86. That and other stories tonight. Here's Steve with the rundown. In search of a home, 155 Tamil refugees are accepted by Canada. But how did they get here? Tonight, the United Nations High Commission on Refugees, George Gordon Lennox and Sharon Rusu. She's best known as a leader of the Rat Pack in Ottawa, and she never lets the government forget it. I resent his remarks in the House here, here. talking about quiet down baby. I'm not his baby, and I'm nobody's baby, and I'd like him to withdraw those remarks. Sheila Copps is in the studio with Webster. But first, join Jack as he goes bargain hunting under the roof at BC Place Stadium. Expo is on the auction block. Come with me to the biggest garage sale in history. The leftover bits and pieces, some highly valuable, some worth nothing, of, excuse me, ma'am, Expo 86. And I'm going to, how are you, took this wallet? Come on, look at the camera. See? And come and help me shop for my Expo 86 memorabilia. Start with the old clothing. Wet paint, wet paint. What are you doing? What are you doing? Okay. Can we take a peek? No, oh, no, please, please. <laughs> what size is that? I'm not telling. How much are you going to pay for it? Twelve dollars. Twelve dollars. You buy one for the old. Is that your father there? This, this is, is the my extra father. large one. It'll fit you. Extra large to fit me. Twelve dollars. Right. Is that a good buy? It's a good buy. Where are you from? It's a bargain. Vancouver. Vancouver. Yeah. Jolly good show. Who else is buying things? <laughs> what did you buy? Employees only. Let me see it. <laughs> Employees only. Employees only. Oh, washrooms. Oh, <laughs> you, you've got unisex uh, washrooms in your house. Yes, yep. And what's this? Uh, posters and, and sweater for Dad. <laughs> How much did Dad's sweaters cost? $10. How much did the posters cost? A dollar each, I think. And what's your name? Cap. Nice to meet you. Cap, where are you from? Coquitlam. Cap from Coquitlam. <laughs> Thanks, Cap. Oh! You took my toe off. I know you. I've seen TV all the time. Do you really know me? Yeah, what I did know, you buy? Yeah. What did you buy? Posted. How much? Two dollars. Two dollars. Best of luck. Don't you. be so brutal the next time. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> well, this will be gone, I think, before night time. How much do you spend? Oh, probably about a hundred dollars. Hundred? How come you're not working today? Well, I'm from the interior, and I came down just specifically for this. Where about the interior? Vernon. Vernon. And your name? My name is Hano. Hano. Right. And are these for your kids, or are these for yourself? Christmas gifts for friends. Buying your Christmas You betcha. Good That's for good you. Good for you. Tell me, what are you looking for? What's this? <laughs> hey, what is it? A flag. <laughs> Whose flag is it? Just anybody's flag. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you buying flags? Oh, something for decorations. And your name? It's Tracy. From? Burnaby. How much? I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> I haven't found a price tag yet. <laughs> ah, it won't be that much. Seven dollars. Okay. <laughs> what a buy. What a buy. If I'd known that, I'd have bought one before I went to Ottawa for that Crosby roast. Sixty-five dollars. There's only one snag. <laughs> They've only got midget sizes. <laughs> Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. May I inter interest you in a, one of these caps? One of these caps? <laughs> what have you bought here today, What have madame? I bought here today? Well, you wouldn't believe. This is for my son, because his name is Malcolm. So that's M for Malcolm. Right, and this is a tuxedo. Cummerbund. This is for my son also. How much was that? Um, five dollars. Five dollars. Great buy. You're great buy. And um, what else did I buy? Oh, um, thing for around the house for me. Good. Yeah, <laughs> terrific. Oh, beer and wine will be served until five minutes before the show starts and up to five minutes before the end of the intermission. Uh, yeah, is this intermission time? That's intermission now. <laughs> Serve yourself a bee. <laughs> beer. Thank you very much, Thank Malcolm's you. mother. Okay, then. How do you like that hat, eh? I wonder if I could shoplift it. No, it leaves you with a criminal record forever. I'll have to pay for it. 
<laughs> just, do you mind if I jump the queue? Oh, oh no, you go right ahead. You don't. No, we want you at the back of the line. No, 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 where are you from? Huh? I'm right from here. I've been in since 8 o'clock this morning. Well, I've been in since 20 minutes and, ago. And you want to come up in the front yeah. of the line? Hey, that's not fair, is well, it? Kind of slight. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm precise. Hello, how are you? Good morning, yeah, sir. Good morning, sir. Morning, sir. Two, four, four. Tell you what I bought. Would you hold that, please? Yeah, sure. Flag. No, you hold that, please. <laughs> 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 BCTV for we Bobby McKee. The wrong size, Jack. It's the wrong <laughs> size. It's not going to fit. It would fit you. <laughs> 75, 85, and Thanks very much for letting me through. Thank bye, you. bye, bye. <laughs> Rob, nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Jack. This is the BC Place spokesman who knows all uh, about this auction. Now, uh, what's this you're leaning on? This is an armored vehicle that was used for transporting uh, dignitaries and such like during Expo. Here? This is it. Solid bulletproof? This, this is it. Solid glass, uh, armor plating. We have gun ports in the doors. What more could you want? If I happen to bid for it, when will it be, when will it be, when will it be up for auction? 6.30 to 7 tonight, sometime tonight. in that period. Well, if I could buy it, I could give it to Keith Davies so all the other liberals don't kill him. It's Not got a high-speed engine so he can get away from them as well. Uh, but it'd uh, be about a mile and a half to the gallon. Question, what times are the auctions today and tomorrow? All day today, uh, we're having a liquidation sale. Those are the items you just walk in The marked buy. items. The auction, 12 o'clock, uh, noon through 9 o'clock tonight. And again tomorrow. And again tomorrow. You want to register and get a catalog, and that tells you when everything's coming up. Okay, you can keep your bulletproof car. I bet you it doesn't go for more than 15000 I'm not going to bet you. I'm, I haven't been in the bulletproof car market long much, enough to tell. How much do you plan to raise overall figure for the odds and ends, apart from the big rides and the separate items like the monorail? Well, we'll be over $10 million before we get to the buildings, so uh, we're in that order. Good. It'll all help to cut down any conceivable deficit. That's Thanks, Rob. Idea. Thank you, Rob. I'm not touching the hem of Jimmy Patterson's gown. I'm touching the back of his desk. They call it the Terminator's desk. And it's going on the block at 7 o'clock tonight. Also, Zargon and Expo Ernie will be up for bid and a lot of the, the big fancy stuff. A man from Maynard say, uh, tell me, how is the bidding? Is on the high side more than you expected? Oh, I think it's going very well, Jack. I, I think it's probably uh, going as to about what we expected. Is it mostly amateur bidding? Ah, well, there's uh, there's some familiar faces out here, and uh, there's a lot of maybe newcomers also. You got an upset price on the armored car, the armored, armored cars at all? No, there's no upset price. No there. upset prices. No. They'll go for whatever they can get. Whatever we get for it, right. Thank you. This is something everybody needs. Genuine, 100% Philippine, Manila-type jitney. Some smart aleck over there. Number 443 at Maynard's auction. Oh, believe it or not, this cedar elephant carved with a chainsaw cost $35,000. And it'll be an auction tonight. Tonight and tomorrow night until 9 p.m., you know, noon until 9, but there'll be interminable auctions between now and Christmas to dispose of what's left over from British Columbia's magnificent expo. And I'll be back after the break. Ugly fella at that end. I love the lady with the M, the little old lady that was... <laughs> it ran over your foot. Yeah, I will. She was so enamored, she was staring. <laughs> One minute. Hutch McGeechee talk. What line's he on? Put this right down here. 
What do you want? Quick. Good. Mm -hmm. How's that, John? Everything okay? Bye. That idiot, Makichi. Just that. Mm -hmm. 30. Now, be nice to these people, Jack. Canadians are still muttering about that somewhat extraordinary scene where 150-odd Tamils arrived in mysterious lifeboats which appeared off our coast. And they, of course, were admitted as refugee immigrants to Canada. And, of course, people do get annoyed and talk in the pubs about the people who arrive under um, kind of phony claims that they're being persecuted. There were thousands of Portuguese who were pretending, I think, to be persecuted in that country. Many other nags, but Canada has a very good reputation for taking and handling refugees. And I have two people here tonight. First, Sharon Russo, who is a special refugee consultant to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees in this country, and George Gordon Lennox, representative to Canada for the UN High Commission. Now, do you get upset when people like me point out that there are some refugee things which don't meet instant favor from all Canadians? Absolutely not. I think that, uh, that Canadians have every right to question uh, what happens in their country. Because we get kind of fed up when we think that the Sri Lankans, for instance, already had a haven. They were in Germany, wasn't it? Yes, they were in camps. And all they did was jump the queue so that other legitimate refugees with no haven could have been denied that space. Is that correct? They must have been quite desperate, I think, to take that, uh, to make that move, to, to, to spend uh, what little money they had. They didn't have any jobs. It wasn't little money. It was a lot of money to get a ship to bring them all the way across the Atlantic. Indeed, and they must have been quite desperate. But how many desperate uh, refugees are there throughout the world? Over 10 million. More than 10 million refugees? Yes. Yes. Are we expected to take them all? Of course not. Of course we're not. But I don't think that's the point here with, with respect to these particular Tamils, if we can bring ourselves back to that. I sure. think the point here is that uh, the, the fundamental point is that they were desperate. But more than that, uh, I think that the Canadian uh, response was interesting. And, and, uh, and I have a certain amount of skepticism about the response as well. Because working with refugees and working in the international scene with refugees, it is a given that if someone arrives with documents mm -hmm. in a bona fide manner, mm -hmm. the question is, in a, an asylum country other than Canada, the question always is, are these people really refugees? These people arrived in a manner that, that, that most refugees so to arrived sure, to a to first asylum To be country. sure to get in there, for you've got to be one of the 2,600 immigrants who landed in Canada in the first seven months of this year who had torn up their passports mm -hmm. or were traveling on fraudulent documents. Uh, I think uh, when the Tamils arrived, uh, what wasn't reported in the press was that uh, an equal number arrived that week mm -hmm. by plane. Yeah. Uh, or illegitimately. Or one, one or the other. Oh, but the lifeboats ca life caught the attention. Oh, I mean, yeah. that of was course. really quite of funny. Course. But how many refugees, we're not very good bureaucratically at uh, establishing the status of refugees, are we? In fact, we're in a bureaucratic botch up. True or false? I think that uh, a good system uh, was set up uh, many years ago, uh, which was set up for a small number of people, and uh, wasn't adapted to a new situation. How many are in many the more. backlog now? Well, around 20,000, but that is, that is diminishing. That is diminishing. The, the, the system is working as well as it can, but of course you know we're awaiting new legislation, and we're hoping that once the new legislation is in place, that the bureaucracy will keep up with the demand. One of the points of the new legislation is that uh, it will not let in those people who have established claims in other countries and are, in fact, no longer refugees. That's, that's fine. That, that's fine. If they have uh, not only established claims, but uh, receive protection. Yeah. What we're interested in internationally is that refugees be protected one way or another. How many more refugees should we be taken, taking in any given year? I think, I think that, that, that my response to that, Jack, would be that uh, we have to look at two things in Canada right now. We have to look at uh, a declining birth rate and an aging population. And if we're to be, according to our, our policy makers and to our politicians, you know, if we are to be marketable, 
internationally marketable in the year 2000, we have to look at a population somewhere between 35, 35 million and 40 million people. In other words, we've got to take refugees regardless because well, we need we've, them. We've got to take people. We've well, got to take people. Well, the policy of the Canadian government as it amends its immigration regulations at the moment is to tighten up on certain family unification and to make sure that people have skills which can enable them to adjust to our technological society. So maybe the Canadian government is out of touch too. But I think that in addition to those people who you want to get, uh -huh. um, a relatively small number of other people uh -huh. uh, should also be admitted to Canada and are. Even people with handicaps, for instance, Sharon deals a lot with that uh, uh, category, uh, an infinite minority of refugees yes. who also, because of Canada's generous tradition, um, get and should go on getting uh, uh, a welcome in this country. How do we stand in international reputation on uh, handling of refugees? Obviously pretty well. We've received the Nansen Award this year. I think that's a pretty good indication of how we stand. Nansen? Nansen. Was he a Norwegian or a Swedish? Nansen, I have a prop here, Who Jack. was Nansen? Nansen, this is uh, the Nansen medal, if the camera can see it. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the Norwegian explorer who uh, went to the North Pole. Uh, he was the first High Commissioner for Refugees under the League of Nations 65 years ago, and the medal was named after him. This year, it's being given to the people of Canada, not to one individual, but all the many people out there that uh, uh, have helped refugees over, over the years, over the past 35 years. So we must years. have done a lot of things right. You're right. We must have okay. done something right. So what, should we, what do we do now? What's the proper attitude, the proper approach to refugees, especially, you know, not to nag, but when things are slipping quite badly from our normally very high affluence to a standard of living which isn't as high as we had wanted it to be, do you think bringing in more refugees will help us to recreate our economy? May I just say two things to that, Jack? The first thing is, is that for, for one reason or another, we have, we have continued to look at refugees as liabilities in this country. They are a resource. Historically, and in, in a very pragmatic way, immigrants in this country have proven to be a resource to this country. That's the first point. Say that again. You're the, looking at one. And you're looking at another one here. <laughs> the, second, the second point that I would make is that, um, is that quite clearly, uh, there, is, there is every indication to believe that we have a problem demographically in this country. The policymakers now are looking at ways to fill up Canada. And what better way to, to maintain uh, the kind of impetus that we have with the Nansen Medal and the kind of, the kind of uh, good sense that we've shown in the past with respect to admitting uh, immigrants to this country, but then by continuing what we've been doing. Well, we'll see how many people... Well, I'm going to give you a chance to talk to some viewers tonight. George Gordon Lennox, UN High Commission for Refugees, and Sharon Russo. You're originally from Victoria. No, I'm originally from Saskatchewan. Oh, I and thought you yes. looked bright enough to be from Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Parents didn't have that kind of money. <laughs> Calls on refugees after the break. My two guests are from the UN High Commission for Refugees. Go ahead, please. Hello. I'm phoning to say that I'm very much in favor of admitting a lot more people to Canada. I think we need many more people. Uh, there are those who feel that uh, joblessness is due to uh, too many people for the jobs there are. I, I think it's just the social and economic order of things. I think we could do much better. And I think that the world belongs to the people of the world, and I, I hope that uh, our policy uh, will admit a lot more people in the future because we need them. Shannon? Thank you very much. Ex Bye -bye. Excellent point. I, I, would, I would agree entirely uh, and, and would thank this gentleman for his very good sense and international spirit. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hi. Hi. I've uh, worked at international airports in Canada for 20-some years. And every day people are entering the, our country, violating immigration laws for entry, and they are granted certain rights at a tremendous cost to the taxpayers of this country. I, I think that's wrong. Even if the refugees, or are you talking about immigration? I'm talking about our general immigration policy, including refugees. A number of people show up uh, claiming refugee status, and there are <laughs> no more refugees than you or I, Jack. What do you say to that, George? Some of them certainly are, and some of them certainly aren't, and I can understand this gentleman's frustration at seeing it going on over the years indeed. 
but uh, uh, when someone asks for refugee status, I think what you need to have and what the, the legislation that is coming up is looking for is a speedier and more efficient way of uh, respecting that person's right to ask for asylum and deciding whether or not he or she is a refugee. The moment uh, anyone puts a foot in Canada now, they have the same rights as any, you might call, full-fledged Canadians to go through to the hearings if it takes them five years, correct, Sharon? Uh, yes, and yes, as long as if after they're admitted and they claim refugee status, you're right. After yes. they're in the country? They have to be in the country. Once they've landed in the country? That's right. And the point you're making is, and you're making too, and I would make as well, is that we must have a system whereby people are given, if they are a phony refugee, given an instant or a fairly quick decision and said, sorry, you've got to leave. Absolutely. That's, right. yes. That's that the point that is frustrating me. Is that, the that came under the Charter of Rights, I think, old boy. That was what happened on the, either the Supreme Court or the, the Federal Court, Court of Canada. Decision, yes. Supreme Court decision. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yep. Uh, that young lady, uh, she made a comment there. Uh, uh, we've got to take them, or we have to take them. Now, let it be well understood. She may speak for herself. She's not talking for me, and I resent this all-inclusive phrase, we've got to take them. We don't got to take them. There's lots of reasons that they should apply in the proper fashion. If you were talking strictly about people coming in as refugees, we are the biggest marks in the world and it recognized as such. You try that in the States and see what happens, in dumping people off and then having them apply there. Yeah, well, they have a different system. We have a different system and it's uh, not a very good system, but please, that lady is not speaking for me. Sharon, that man is what you might call doubtful about your cause. Well, I think I want to thank him, first of all, for saying young lady. Thank you very much, sir. It was very, very, very kind of you. Uh, but secondly, I don't remember saying uh, we've got to take them. I think that the point that we were attempting to make in all of that was that uh, refugee, refugees in, in the international context uh, are under uh, tremendous stress, and those who are bona fide refugees will be found to be that through a system which is expeditious and, and moves them forward quickly, and that should stop the abuses. Uh, I don't remember saying we've got to take them, but uh, I but think that they have was, a right to... It's advisable to, for us to take as many immigrants as a, we can. It's advisable for us to take numbers simply because of the problems that Canada faces now and in the future. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I think it's uh, crazy all this taking the... Uh, all this number of immigrants into this country you can't get it's common sense that you um, you know if, if you have so many people and you can't feed everybody here why take more people on uh, you look at all the, the low-paying labor jobs uh, down at the docks or in the sawmills and you'll see that uh, there's a great number of uh, new Canadians who are uh, taking not, jobs that uh, not that the docks there isn't <laughs> Yes, that, even there. No, that's a pretty tight, close shop. But that's not an uncommon reaction you must face yeah. as you go across the country. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask your guests a question. I've, I'm an unemployed uh, construction worker, union construction worker, and I'd like to know what country I can claim refugee status uh, uh, to relieve being uh, oppressed by my government here in British Columbia. <laughs> um, no answer to that one, but there was a good cartoon in the paper the other day about someone claiming refugee status from Canada. Yeah. I think that is at about that level because where, as there may well be that kind of difficulty, which again, this gentleman uh, is in a situation where he feels frustrated, mm -hmm. but is he persecuted? And I think that's the difference. That's the difference. Thank you. How many of the, you say, 10 million refugees in camps throughout the world? Yes. How many should we be taking on an annual basis? And what's the present figure we take? I we, forget. We take, uh, take 12,000 government sponsored. We take another 4,500 through private sponsorship. And we take another, to make it equal, uh, 21,000 through special programs. We take 21,000 refugees. We take 115,000 immigrants altogether. And the refugee portion is part of that. How many should we be taking? Well, that's I mean, we can't up. take the 10 million. Of course not. Of course not. And there is no way that, that anyone in, in our shop or uh, of those concerned for refugees who would consider that to be a practical solution to their problems. <laughs> refugees who are taken in resettlement 
mm. for resettlement are those people for whom there is no other solution. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good level. Uh, I think that that level must be maintained. It's arrived, those figures are arrived at with a great deal of consultation all across the country. Go ahead from Victoria. Oh, hello, Jack. Um, I would love the, like to ask the people with you, um, how come these people can get into the country so easily when British people, including myself and maybe you, uh, all the papers we had to sign, the medical exams we had to go through, the amount of money we were going to bring into the country. Ma'am, we're talking about refugees and not immigrants. Well, I don't see why they should get in like that. It's all wrong. For immigrants, it was just a question of filling in the paper in my day, and they, they kind of hustled you onto the boat. <laughs> well, I, uh, really, they got, they're, they're a drain on society, these people. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Yes, one thing that we seem to be getting a lot of now is bad press on the gangs coming from the Orient and stuff like that. And I'm wondering what we can do with these refugees when they become criminals in our society. Because I don't think we should have to burden the cost of imprisoning these people or whatever we feel we're going to do. Local problem. But we have a local problem on Especially that. Especially in Vancouver, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that when you admit a refugee, uh, that person has to conform to the laws of the country just like anyone else and can be prosecuted uh, for committing crimes just like anyone else. That's the only weapon we have in that case. You can't deport them, really, unless they entered, then you can prove that the knowing entered with criminal records which were kept secret. Am I right? That's right. right. Still remember a bit about the immigration. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. That's you, ma'am. Yes, I, w I heard a comment earlier that you were saying there was lots of illegal people coming in through the airport. Now, lots of people with uh, fraudulent documents and perhaps not the right papers and there are many fiddles in immigration. But okay, if they come in illegally and under false pretenses, what makes you believe that we think that we can believe anything they do in this country is going to be honest if they come in a false, under false pretense? I think that's a very good question and it is, it is, it is very difficult. Again, it relates to the fact that uh, these people have nowhere to go. They're under uh, a tremendous strain to find a place where they can be accepted in order for them to tell their story. And often that means accessing illegal documents. You're exactly right. It, it is difficult for us to know. But we, who knows what we would do if we were in fear of our lives and had to get Absolutely. That is the corollary to that, and that's a perfect corollary. Well, thank you. When do we get the Nansen Medal? It's going to be given to the Governor General of Canada on behalf of the whole people of Canada on 13th November uh, in Ottawa. I wish you well, Shannon Rousseau, and you too, Gordon. Uh, you've got a double battle name. George Isn't that awful? George, George. Gordon Lennox, <laughs> United Nations High Commission on Refugees. Next, uh, going to learn how to write a book when you've only been in politics five minutes from Sheila Cox after the break. <laughs> Such a mess, the immigration department. It's just bloody scandalous. Oh, there was something we've in the paper today. A, we've got at least a thousand seat terrorists here. In oh, Vancouver? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Terrible. The whole Sikh East Indian community is totally terrorized. They're taking control of all the temples and the uh, you know, I know what I was Sikh. reading in the paper. There oh. was a thing in the paper today. What am I going to do with Sheila? Um, <laughs> What's your news story? Oh, my human rights story? Yeah. Where is that? I brought it in this morning, the human rights story. It was in my bloody briefcase. She accused the minister of uh, fiddling right. the... She doctored the... Doctoring the resumes. curricula. Right. And the minister is... <laughs> Raina Titian. Minister of Justice. 30 seconds. I had that bloody thing in my briefcase. <coughs> There's a newspaper. We've only got one. Maybe if you briefcase people might Fifteen. I'm going to get in trouble with my next guest that's sure as fate because she's got a book out oh and she looks so beautiful in the book and in real life nobody's baby <laughs> is it not a fact Sheila Cop that as of this moment you are pregnant I plead the fifth. <laughs> yes, it is. When are you going to have the baby? In March. 
Well, that's not nobody's baby. No, my husband is certainly not nobody, but uh, I think you... I have to thank John Crosby for the title, and actually the title of the book was chosen before I knew I was pregnant. Is that so? <laughs> I had to rewrite some of the galleys because in the book I talk about what I would do if I had a child and I hadn't told anybody but when I sent the proofs back to Toronto scratching out if and writing in when my publisher called and she said are you pregnant? I said how did you know? I had to rewrite the book to update it a little you bit. You don't mind talking about having a baby do you? No of course not. We talked about it the last time I was on the show. <laughs> But you weren't pregnant no, at the no, time. No, no, that was just a wishful thinking. <laughs> you had raised the subject. No, John Lindsay had to raise the subject. <laughs> That's correct. Now, uh, I don't know what to talk about. I see you crossing trouble in the House of Commons again, just, was it yesterday? Day before? Yes. You were nagging Ray Natishan, the new Minister of Justice, because you accused him of what? He doctored the resumes of the PC appointees to the Human Rights Commission. He took the resumes from the commission. In the commission, they made reference to people's affiliation with the PC party. I had asked for the resumes because the new committee rules require us to review all resumes. His office called the commission and said, don't send any resumes to members. I want them to come to my office. And when we finally received them, they were laundered. They had well, no then, PC references in them. Let me get this properly. And the Titian or his department has appointed a number of new people to human rights panels, to That's be available right. for you know, human rights panels. The first batch of 58 appointees included people like one Nova Scotian who gave us his resume the fact that he had contributed to the Robert Coates Defense Fund. And when the first batch came out with a number of incredible resumes that had very strong PC connections, he got rather embarrassed and he called the commission and said no more resumes were to be released to members of the committee without his approval. He diverted the resumes to his office and strangely between the commission and his office all references to the PC party were dropped. Is that not the kind of things the Liberals did in their heyday too? I mean look at all the all the appointments you people well, made. Well listen Jack, I, when the first batch came through and we had people like this gentleman who says that his redeeming quality is that he contributed to the Robert Coates Defense Fund, we contacted human rights groups and said look are these people do they have any other redeeming qualities? Just because they're PCs, they're not necessarily bad people. And it was the human rights groups who said that they have no other experience or involvement in the field of human rights. Uh, the only thing they, they have going for them is their political connections. They've loaded the human rights panel panels with party hacks who have no real feeling, you would tell me, for human rights problems. And those people are making decisions on employment policies for Canada. They're not just advising the government. They're actually making, right now, the National Bank of Canada is appealing through the Charter to the Supreme Court because they say the Commission has no right to exist because the people who are appointed are appointed on a random basis in a partisan way and not in an objective way. Okay, that fight will go on for weeks, I suppose, in question period. I oh, saw I'm some sure. of it today in question period. I'm sure that it will uh, carry on. Now, tell me the truth. I don't want to nag you about it. Tell me the truth. You will vote for Turner at the, for no leadership review in November, is absolutely. that correct? That's absolutely right. I will not only vote for him, I will do everything that I can to see that he gets full support. He has your total commanding, total support. Total unequivocal support. I he think he a, deserves it. Is he a much better potential leader than Paul Martin Jr.? <sighs> Paul Martin Jr. hasn't gone through a leadership convention. Paul Martin Jr. hasn't faced the scrutiny of the public. I think John Turner has earned our respect. Don and Johnson? Ditto. Uh, there's one other. Jean Chrétien? Jean Chrétien, you know, he's out of the picture. I thought he was but off it, in Greece. Is it not a fact, though, that this Davy attack has really damaged Turner, and here's Broadbent coming up like gangbusters in the poll, 33%. It may well be with, the, with Turner as your leader, it might be a battle between the Tories and the NDP well, actually, in the next election. No, Bro Broadbent's up to 29. We're still leading and we've been leading for nine months. I think, if anything, Keith Davies' attack has served to act as a catalyst because there are a lot of people in the Liberal Party who are sitting on the fence who are now saying, hey, you're talking about grassroots. John Turner has taken this party back to the grassroots. He's rebuilding from the ground up. And for Keith Davey to come in and make the statements that he's made, Keith Davey, who was a backroom boy for a lot of years without a lot of grassroots involvement, is a farce. Mm -hmm. But he still regards himself as a big power in the party. That was very unfair, too, about the leak on Iona's mortgage, wasn't it? 
Well, that was, I don't know what the story was behind that. You see, I think I could say quite brutally that uh, good and faithful servants of the Liberal Party generally got Senate seats, right? You That's put your right. old boys in the Senate. Uh, Iona didn't get the Senate, so what does Iona get? She gets a leak that there had been a plan to pay off her mortgage as, as compensation. Well, I think that that was probably part of the uh, the campaign to sort of somehow shed mistrust on everyone who was supporting Turner. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, and I was in Pembina, mm -hmm. I was in uh, Saskatchewan during the Saskatchewan election, I think a lot of grassroots people are tired with the power brokers who are trying to run from the back rooms and what they want is more of the kind of leadership that John Turner has been giving. Uh, Sinclair Stevens. Now you were in the vanguard of the attack on Stevens, were you not? I was somewhat involved, yes. You certainly were. It'd be much better for if Eric Nielsen had stopped waffling and if Sinclair Stevens had just resigned at that time, the whole, we'd never have heard of all this detail, would we? That's right. They should have cut bait. And I blame the Prime Minister for that, because no matter what you have written down in the Code of Ethics, I mean, he introduced the code in September of 85, he called it the strongest code in the Western world. When somebody is taking advantage, or even apparently taking advantage of the public purse for his own family gain, he should have been fired on the spot and cut bait. And then if a year from now he was sufficiently rehabilitated, fine. Just been stated by his lawyer that there's been no gain whatsoever for Mr. Stevens, none at all. No how family that? gain. Well, how did his family come up with a $2.6 million interest-free loan? Oh, the breakfast conversation. Yes. Okay, now, we haven't talked about why you've written this book when you've only been five minutes in public life. Is it selling at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know how these things work? The first edition is actually sold out. It's 20000 but, you know, people reserve the right to take these books back, you see. But apparently it's going quite well. And the market is a lot different from the other political books because it really is targeted toward women and people who are sitting on the fringes. It's not a book for the political insiders. It's more for the public. Yeah, no one condemns... Uh, people make remark about your frumpy clothes, don't they? <laughs> Well, that, but that comes with the territory, I see. But no one condemns men for their suits or their bald spots. Well, I was, I was making a comment that when I was running for the leadership in Ontario, there was actually a Toronto Star article which described me as a vivacious brunette. And they never sort of dump those uh, little stereotypes on men. Yeah, what could you call me? Don't <laughs> You're I could call you something, but it probably would never be aired. I, the CRTC would be after me. Um, Chat up, uh, Sheila Copps. Now, not being patronizing or sexist. Chat she can up. chat up. That means <laughs> chat up means ask a question. Oh, okay. And it's not patronizing. I only insult people I like. After the break. <laughs> Were you when you ran for parliament? When you ran for public life? The first time? Yeah, 24. First. What was that for? MLA in Ontario. And you lost? That's right. Uh, you ran for, it wasn't Peterson you were running for, was it? No, no I ran in Hamilton Centre and after I was elected in 81, then I ran against Peterson, David Peterson for the leadership. Lost I was that in one. 82, that's right. And then you ran for the House of Commons? In 84. 84, so you've been, what, two years in the House of Commons? That's right. It's great though, and you're so fond of the Tories, aren't you? Who's, oh, I do have so much you, fun. Which one do you hate the most? <laughs> <laughs> That's like asking, when was the last time you beat your wife? Yeah, no. <laughs> I won't ask you to answer that question. Go ahead, please. Yes, you know, Jack, you were correct in Broadbent being ahead of Turner, and she's incorrect. The thing was that she had... Oh, I was speaking of the parties. 29% NDP in the polls. That's oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So Broadbent was picked. If, if you wanted a leader for this oh, country, that's now right. who would you take? And they said they would take Broadbent and that's then right. Turner, then Mulroney. And another thing, when they had the debates prior to the election, Broadbent came out ahead in all those debates continually. And I would suggest that maybe they should run Broadbent against Turner. Then after he gets elected, he can convert all liberals to be NDPs. <laughs> is, it, is it not a fact, Sheila Cops, that one day there will have to be an alliance between the left wing of the Liberal Party and the right wing of the NDP because you're not that far apart anywho? Well, it's quite possible that if we were in a minority government situation, we'd be working very closely together. I think 
if I can draw from the experience of the NDP in Ontario, the NDP are probably going to be far shyer about that type of alliance than we would be. Because they haven't done very well under Peterson. They absolutely bombed in public support, even though they signed the agreement and kind of worked together with the Liberals. They haven't gotten any of the credit. And Peterson, is he a future Prime Minister of Canada, do you think, as a Liberal? He's certainly been touted as that. I think he has a lot of the qualities. I think at this point, uh, his job is to solidify our gains in Ontario because it's been a long time since we were in the wilderness there. Go ahead, please. Hello. Um, I'm an NDP. -er. One reason I wouldn't support the Liberals is, is on their foreign policy in areas such as Central America. I've heard Jean Chrétien um, state that he supports the so-called experiment under Duarte. But a question I have for you, uh, Ms. Cups, is um, has anybody in the Liberal Party actually gone so far as to introduce a private member's bill with regard to having an elected Senate, as Stanley Knowles of the NDP has done? John Turner supports an elected Senate. Have you? Yes, but has there been a, a, a private member's bill introduced? Have you put your... Well, Stanley Knowles, at this point, you know, the pri uh, the private member's bill, sure, I could introduce one tomorrow. The private member's bill means nothing. But what does so, it mean if you get re-elected and, you know, you just go back to the same old... No, but a private... Me a, a How private do we trust the Liberals aren't going to do it again? A private member's bill is a statement by one person. John Turner has already made the statement. He supports an elected Senate. So, I mean, so whether you do it through a law, through a private member's bill or not, they're making the same statement. You regard that, therefore, as liberal leadership policy, if not party policy. Well, he's taken that position as a personal point of view. It's certainly the view of a lot of people in the Liberal caucus that the Senate should either be made elected or even the tenure should be cut short, maybe five-year terms or just cut it back. So Certainly it should be, changes. shouldn't it? Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Yes, for a great number of years, uh, your father was uh, mayor of Hamilton, Mayor Victor Copps. And I was wondering if your book should not have been titled Victor's Baby. And secondly, um, I'd like to know what influence your father did have in your being in politics today. Well, in the book I talk about the fact that I grew up in a political family. I certainly think that that had an influence on my life. Both my parents were, you know, coming from a, a background of community service and being involved in the community. My father has been sick for over 10 years, and when I actually got involved in politics, it was after he had gotten sick, so he really didn't have any sort of direct influence to say, Sheila, go for it. He suffers brain damage, and so he's really not yes. capable. Yes, I certainly understand that, but, but, but was but, he not sort of a, a drive, or did well, he not sure. sort of uh, years previously influence you in any way towards politics? Oh, absolutely. Politics? He influenced me, but I, what I say in the book, because I spend a lot of time in the book also talking about how women in particular a lot of us are afraid to get into politics because we think it might interfere with sort of family and other things in our family my sister who grew up in virtually the same circumstances as I she absolutely hates politics <laughs> she wouldn't give you five cents for political office she helps me you know because we're family and loyal and that kind of thing well, so the fact that I grew up animals. that's right everybody everybody's a different person and you okay, can't really okay, judge. thank you go ahead please Hello. Hello. That's you. Okay. Um, uh, I would like to first of all say to uh, Sheila that uh, clothes do not make a man or a woman. And uh, I agree. I think I like her, the way she dresses very well. And you're also a sweet baby. <laughs> and I wouldn't take offense to that either, except that I'm pleased that you made your stand. I think uh, also, Jack, uh, I would like to say um, I watch your program about 80% of the time, and 80% of the time I'm satisfied with it. But I think that you should spend some more time on the um, this immigration thing. The, that was kind of great, a great show, and I really am interested in that. You could probably spend an hour show doing it's that. A real, it's a real tough one, that, doing a show on immigration. The fact is that I have been disgusted for years. Matter of fact, when the Auditor General first did an attack on the abuses in immigration in his report, and we did him on the subject, you know, at this end of the country, after he crossed the country, he said I was the only reporter in the country that asked about immigration rackets, because immigration rackets have been endemic in this country for a long while. No objection to refugees, no objection to immigrants. What I object to are the rackets. That's my big. And you don't like Well, the problem with the rackets, too, I mean, when you're working as an MP, you meet a lot of people who really are very desperate mm -hmm. to have 
a family member, a relative, a parent come in and they will do just about anything and somebody comes along and says, look, you pay me $2,000 and I will get your relative in the country. And we have to tell them, look, these people are just conning you. But the other reason I stay away from it is if you go after a specific racket, as I've done many times over many years, you sound like a bleeding racist and you're not. You're merely pointing out a defect in the system. So I t generally tend to back off from it, one reason or another. Go ahead, please. It appears to me that backbenchers in the House today are lacking confidence and professional skill in the House. I'd like to know if Sheila Copps agrees with this, because they don't speak up a lot. And I'd like to say that her, if she's a backbencher, I'm not sure her position there, she's but her and her attack have done quite well and proves that the fairly new person can do quite well. Why aren't these people speaking up, and why is it when they do, they sometimes make fools of themselves? Why, you can't ask her that question, but from the moment you went into the House of Commons, you weren't the least bit shy about standing up and saying, Mr. Speaker. No, I wasn't shy, and I guess I've never been shy before I got into politics when I've been involved. I think that there are some people who have a different kind of a style, and unfortunately some people who may be asking some very effective questions in the House don't get any coverage because the way it comes across, uh, people lose it. Not one government has survived the television in the House yet, has it? I mean, the question period is not really the best representation of what happens in the House, is it? No, it is not, although I think if you look back historically, Trudeau handled himself pretty well in question period. Very well, but I mean, any time you're up on your feet, whoever's editing it for the networks will say, hey, Cops was up today. What was she shouting about, right? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. No doubt about that. That's showbiz. That's right. Uh, you, know, you want a break? Stay for another five minutes. We're going to have a free-for-all with Sheila Cops and Old Man Webster after the break. Sheila Cops, nobody's baby, MP from Hamilton East. And you can take the calls tonight. Nobody's being nasty to you. It's I most know, upsetting. I want to hear some nasties. I mean, you're not your usual shrill self. Go ahead, please. Hi, Sheila. Hi. Fortunately, I'm not nasty. Oh, I okay. wanted to get down to UBC Bookstore today to tell you how much I enjoyed watching you on the TV leap over chairs to get at St. Stephen's. It was just fantastic. Unfortunately, I had a seminar, so I couldn't. Well, thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. Because <laughs> I love I talk it. about it that in the book, too. <laughs> fantastic, to quote a phrase that's in current use in British Columbia. It certainly <laughs> is. Thank you very much, ma'am. Go ahead from Victoria. Hello. Uh, welcome to BC, Sheila. Hello. And, uh, well, I don't know. I'm not really a Liberal supporter or a Tory supporter or an NDP supporter. I do watch the polls quite closely, though. Anyhow, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to see you and John Nunziata, so-called Rat Pack, uh, makes a good opposition. I think that uh, some of the veteran MPs and, and cabinet ministers should have it taken to them once in a while. It keeps them on their toes. Uh, when you get a big majority like that in, in government, it's, it's not good. Is that and all you've got to say? Somebody with guts stand up to them, especially when it's a woman, because like you said earlier, women might be uh, a little bit uh, leery of getting into politics because of family ties and whatnot. Thank you very much. He's giving a little sermon. Go ahead, please. Uh, hi, Jack. Uh, another great show. Uh, I'd like to first of all congratulate you, Miss Copps, for your uh, exposure and publicity that you've gained in your role uh, in the House of Commons and the recognition that you've received as a person who speaks a pretty good party line. But I'd really like to find out your honest opinion about uh, John Turner. As you know, you know, like we have the basic two system as leaders. We have the the patriarch image and uh, that of the swinger. You know, Pierre Trudeau did very well in the swinger image, and you know, developed now, nicely in the Mr. patriarch. Now, where does Mr. Uh, now, John Turner <laughs> might be able to survive a leadership review because he has built that leadership uh, through uh, a rebuilding of the party. He might have the the new age liberal on his side as compared to the old guard of which Keith Davy might be a member of. But do you think? He can really, on behalf of his party, win the next general election. With That's his the question. I believe absolutely that he can. I think that he can show to the country the same thing that he's shown to me. Listen, I was one of his toughest critics. When I came into the House of Commons, before, before the leadership race, I didn't like John Turner. I figured he was a Bay Street boy and there was no way that I was ever going to support him as leader of the Liberal Party, and I didn't. He has made me a believer in the last two years because I've seen the kind of work that he has done. And I think he can do the same thing in the country. But I'll tell you another thing. 
regardless, if I could look into a crystal ball right now and see two years from now that we were not going to form the government in the next election, there is no way that as a liberal I would dump somebody simply because they they may lose an election. I think there's a lot more to liberal politics, there's a lot more to liberal policies, and that's one of the things that we learned. It's not simply a case of winning for the sake of winning. Mulroney did that. And look, you know, look at the mess what right do you now. I mean, it's not simply a case of winning for the sake of winning. That's what? the name of the game. If you thought Tanner would go down the tube, you'd dump him. No, I wouldn't. I would not dump him, and I think, Jack, that I want John Turner to represent the kind of things that I believe is a liberal. If that means that he's not going to succeed, I think he will, because I think the public mm. will buy truth, and they will buy honesty, and they will buy his directness. Mulroney sold victory, and then what happened? He had nothing to offer the people, and that's why he's in the mess he's in today. Go ahead, please. Ms. Copps, uh, what is your purpose of coming to Vancouver? My purpose in coming to Vancouver is first of all to meet with the BC Liberals, UBC Liberals, and secondly to flog my book. Okay. Who <laughs> paid your expenses out here? Who paid my expenses? They're being paid by the publishing company. By which? The publishing company. The publishing company. company. Uh, you're not using your uh, MPs pass on the airline? MPs don't have passes, sir. That's a, a fallacy. You don't? The only people who have passes are uh, ministers. You're allowed uh, so many trips a year, aren't you, on Air Canada? We're allowed X number of trips across the country. And uh, are they paying your uh, hotel and meals? I said publishing that, company. yes, the publishing company is paying that, sir. Thank you, sir. These are better questions, aren't they? Go ahead, please. Good evening, Jack. Good evening. A quick question, Ms. Kopp. Uh, why did you go liberal instead of going conserv conservative? Uh, my thought being that the conservative not being the nicer party, perhaps, but the more realistic. Every time things get tough, people go conservative. Your response? The thought of joining the Conservative Party never crossed my mind, in part because I think that the, the kind of unbridled capitalism and the sort of some of the right-wing attitudes that I see in the Conservative Party don't appeal to me. I think that, if anything, I was wavering between Liberal and NDP. My thanks to you, Sheila Copps, on your book-flogging tour. Um, total tenor supporter. Tomorrow, tricky one tomorrow night, I will be interviewing René Levesque. The former premier of Quebec, the man who wanted to break up the country, but failed at 5 p.m. precisely. From the British Columbia Television Pavilion at Expo, here is Jane McDougall. It seems BC is stuck in a series of Pacific frontal systems that are crossing onto our north coast and then spreading out all over the rest of the place. Now here's one right here, and it's just another one. We've had a whole series of them, and what we're expecting this one to do is come on shore and then give a little sort of, uh, well, some showers and even some rain in for just this region, and then it'll sort of break up and or in BC, but what it's going to do is allow some of its cloud to break away and it'll come down to, let's say, around the Charlottes and, of course, the tip of Vancouver Island. So it means we'll have probably some heavy cloud, maybe even the odd shower as well, and some of that might work into the midsection of the province. So we'll have to wait and see just how sunny those areas get, but we still have this ridge of high pressure. Now, we're running around between a 0 to 10% chance of precip for tomorrow, so that's not a whole bunch to worry about. For the interior, around 10% as well. We have quite a bit of cloud down here and then still some in the region, but it's vacating, so mostly sunny skies expected for tomorrow. Hope they arrive. And up here in the north, little rain on the way. From the British Columbia Television Pavilion at Expo, here is Jane McDougall. It looks like the first day of October is going to be beautiful. We have a wonderful ridge of high pressure down here that is...